welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS and a very warm welcome to our weekly review of international events. What we try to do in this weekly survey is to cover events in countries near and far and how they impact on India's national interest, how the international power equations are changing. And this time what we are going to do is to take a look at the continent of Africa, which has remained neglected as often happens due to developments elsewhere in Europe or in Asia. But people tend to forget that this is a continent which comprises 54 uh, countries. Uh, some would count an additional member and call it 55. It is rich in resources and this is where the multinational corporations fight a battle for the natural resources and this whole continent has suffered due to neo-colonial, neo-imperial exploitation. Independence has not met, meant much to these countries and even countries which are large have suffered despite having been endowed with good natural resources. One such case is Ethiopia which is the second most populous nation uh, in the African continent. It is a large country. Uh, it is a landlocked country. It at uh, one stage was supposed to be the breadbasket of Africa, but has since seen very uh, troubled times. Uh, why it has been in news recently has been due to a civil war, which has been raging since uh, October 2020. Uh, but this has more or less coincided with the COVID pandemic and the world's attention has shifted from this very, very uh, tragic conflict to situations elsewhere. We will have a look at uh, Ethiopia and the ongoing conflict there. We would also try to have a look at Somalia in the Horn of Africa where a new president has been elected. Does this mean that peace would return to this strife-torn region? Uh, it has been... Um, plagued by piracy, plagued by uh, Islamic terroristic uh, violence, uh, and the government seems to have abdicated its responsibility. And this provides, besides the, the Eritrean region, the passage to the sea to Ethiopia. So this is a connect, connected uh, triangle, if one might say so, an uh, irregularly shaped triangle. And the US has recently announced that it is going to put uh, Troops, uh, the US boots will be put on the ground there, small in number, but to ensure that the peace is restored. So we have an interesting complex of volatility in this region. We also would like to take a look at uh, President Biden's uh, tour of Asia, where he has tried to, he is trying to bolster the Quad's formation. He is trying to win over the support of uh, the ASEAN countries in his fight against the Russian expansionism. And let's see how this progresses. And India is also an important member of Quads. And uh, Prime Minister Modi is going to visit Tokyo and participate in person in this summit conference. We also would take a look at Europe, where Turkey has been behaving in an extremely uh, unpredictable manner. At times it says it will block the entry of Sweden and Finland into NATO. At times it says that its vital interests have to be looked after. It is a member of NATO, but it has never uh, shied of irritating um, the United States with its autonomy. It has bought S-400 missiles from Russia, it has been having a very interesting, odd relationship with Russia in its uh, erstwhile republics of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Caucasus, Dagestan, etc. We'll, we'll come to all that. Of course, we'll turn our gaze inwards near neighborhood and see what is happening in Pakistan, how Pakistan's relationship with Turkey is seeming to get closer, how it will affect India. We'll have to look at all this. Uh, so this is what we'll discuss with you this time. The tragedy of Ethiopia is really very saddening. What has happened in the past two or three years is that the poster boy for the Western world, the Prime Minister A.B. Ahmad, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for bringing peace uh, uh, to this uh, geographical territory by ending the war with Eritrea, has turned into a villain himself after he became a Prime Minister. Uh, he has tried to oust the Tigrayans from their predominance in Ethiopian politics. Ethio the Tigrayans have comprise a little more than 6% of the Ethiopian population, but they have for decades been the most dominant ethnic group in the central government. Now, Tigrayans uh, claimed that the 
Nigerian, uh, like Nigeria, Ethiopia also is a federal polity and part of its problems are caused by a special kind of federalism which gives a great autonomy to the states. So the Tigrayans claimed that they were more or less autonomous in most, place, uh, most issues and they declared elections disregarding the advice of the central government uh, which angered uh, Abi very much. Now what happened was that this sparked off a civil war. Uh, central forces were sent and in the beginning the Tigrayan Liberation Front suffered reverses, uh, there were lots of casualties and they withdrew it towards the hills. They, they also resorted to guerrilla warfare and throughout 2021 the fortunes of war kept fluctuating. On five fronts the battle was being waged, at times the Tigrayans were gaining ground, at times uh, the central government's forces were gaining, uh, gaining ground and this was leading to a lot of bloodshed. Over a year, a little more than over a year, around 18 months, people estimate that almost 2 million people have been rendered refugees, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, there have been accusations on both sides um, of rape, genocide, arson, murder, kidnapping, destruction of crops, uh, uh, killing of uh, innocent prisoners and also um, killing cattle. Now what happens is that it is difficult to uh, examine these charges and counter charges because the entry to this war zone has been severely restricted. Even the central government has at times asked the foreign diplomats to get out, uh, humanitarian relief has not been allowed to read and as we said uh, because this conflict has coincided with COVID uh, pandemic, uh, it has been difficult for the world to keep track of what is happening. So everybody keeps talking about the building up of a great humanitarian tragedy, um, famine, malnutrition, drought-like conditions and of course war crimes, crimes against humanity, but neither the Organization of African Unity nor the Amnesty International nor the Human Rights Watch or the Human Rights uh, Commission of the United Nations have proved to be effective enough to check this violence. Then AB decided to dramatically go and uh, take on the command despite his not being a military man in the front himself and this seemed to bring about a reverse in the fortune of the central government. Now the Tiagrins were on the run again, they were forced to concede the ground which they had gained and the central government was very much in action again. In March this year, uh, a truce, uh, uh, a temporary truce was declared and some prisoners of war were released by the Tiagrin Popular Liberation Front and also by the central government. Now, there has, it is, the central government also claims that now that it has restored order, it doesn't want to be politically vengeful and it has allowed the humanitarian assistance to trickle in to Ethiopia. Now the other side claims that this is only AB's effort to have a photo opportunity to change the narrative. Uh, the 100 trucks a day were supposed to come in to deliver humanitarian relief. What is happening that only 10 trucks were allowed, photographs were made, they were transmitted on social media and on television. But after that, uh, the humanitarian uh, relief has once again been stopped. Now, this again is very difficult to verify because the disinformation campaign on both sides is part of the psychological warfare, part of the ideological warfare. So, one cannot say whether peace will actually return in a hurry to Ethiopia. Now, also the problem is that if the situation in Somalia next door remains volatile. So these refugees who have been forced to leave their homes have either headed towards earlier their enemy territories like Eritrea to save their life or go, gone to South or South Sudan and even crossed over the border of a little more distant, little more distant Uganda and all this has created a problem that unless conditions are restored to normalcy, how do these, these refugees get back? What guarantee they have that they would again not be uh, targeted uh, for, for another genocide. Now the population of Ethiopia is very diverse. About 67% are Christians of different denominations and a little over 32% are Islamic people. But this is not a conflict between Islam and Christianity. What complicates the conflict in Ethiopia is in different federating states there are different ethnic groups some are 10 percent, some are 6 percent, some are uh, 5 point some percent and all of them are in a fluid coalition against the central government or in favor of Tigray or against Tigray. 
So it doesn't seem very likely the charges against AB that he is manipulating elections, he is manipulating the narrative may or may not be true. But it also cannot be said with any degree of certainty that the other side is entirely blameless. So what is happening is that Ethiopia is going to remain in a process of instability for some time to come. At the turn of the century, uh, Ethiopia was registering one of the fastest rates of economic growth, not only in Africa, but anywhere in the world. This growth rate was about 10%. Uh, the, the income uh, was over uh, US dollars 3,200. But this per capita income was a little misleading because it was not evenly distributed. However, what caused concern was that before a decade was over, this high rate of rate rate of growth could not be maintained because 10% growth rate was there but it was not generating employment, it was giving triggering inflation, it was the economy was not being very properly managed and once this happened there was a steady decline partly because Ethiopia launched mega projects which it could ill afford to implement immediately. Maybe there was a lot more money spent on the armed forces to cope with the war in Tigray. But the net result was by the time the second decade was coming to an end, Ethiopian growth rate has fallen down drastically and the war with Tigray did the rest. Uh, standing crops were destroyed, there were uh, droughts which could not be managed, humanitarian aid could not reach, the industries dependent on agricultural production suffered, infrastructure couldn't be built up and this cumulative result with the blow dealt by COVID has ruined Ethiopian economy and it will take quite some time before it can be restored to normalcy. Also the Ethiopians have grand aims, grand ambitions to build the great Renesa Dam which we have not heard about but in for the past two years they have reneged on their agreement with Egypt and tried to fill up because they said otherwise the country would be flooded and inundated with water, uh, the situation would be much worse, aggravated, uh, much more internally displaced person would be created. So this activity continues. This brings Ethiopia into conflict with its immediate neighbors, Egypt and Sudan as well. So can Ethiopians manage all these fronts? and manage to bring normalcy to their country is something which we have to watch very carefully. And as we said earlier, this is related to what is going to happen in Somalia. Now, Somalia is a country which looks small on the map and it is very irregularly shaped, but it also has the distinction of having the longest coastline of all the African countries. This also geopolitically is located in a very, very sensitive situation where it dominates the Gulf of Aden access to Suez Canal and much of the world's maritime traffic passes through sea routes along its coast. So there has been piracy which is rife and Islamic groups like Al-Shabaab have been active there. With impunity they have been targeting presidential palace, the air force uh, bases, the airport and also the hotels where foreigners, aid givers, humanitarian agencies work, there have been needless killings. So that probably is the reason why Americans have been forced to send some kind of, if not a peacekeeping force, to protect their own vital interests. But this again is going to be considered as a provocative action by the Chinese next door. And the Indians also cannot remain indifferent to this because Indians are vitally interested in Chinese machinations in this part of Africa. Also, uh, it is important for India's maritime trade because the trade through Gulf is affected by piracy in this region um, and also to the eastern African coast is there where India has tra been traditionally had a long history of close commercial and cultural relationship. So although directly India does not have the kind of presence in Ethiopia or interest in what Ethiopia produces, but at the moment for the African food security, it is important that agriculture and animal husbandry comes back to normalcy. And this is where perhaps India can play a very constructive role in agro-industrial uh, uh, processing, in dairy, in animal husbandry and livestock, where it, its intervention can be humanitarian as well as a projection of India's soft power. U.S. President Biden has embarked on a very ambitious tour of the Asian countries. Uh, he is visiting Korea, 
and he is not only visiting korea he is wooing korea he is wooing korea to set uh, he is treating the vice chairman of the samsung company as uh, cordially as he is dealing with the new president in south korea he is inviting south korea to set up a, a computer chip manufacturing uh, factory in united states so united states doesn't have to suffer because of the supply chain interruptions uh, due to chinese advances in aggressive uh, temperament in south china sea um, but it, the tour did not begin very auspiciously two members advance party of the us president's security team the secret service agents got into a drunken brawl with a, a korean citizen uh, they have been recalled they have been sent back a disciplinary action has been promised but it it sort of uh, left a bitter taste in the mouth it it signaled that the american arrogance is not going to change even when americans are trying to woo asians and trying to say that look we are equal partners now also the interesting part is this that biden had another um, uh, priority in this area he also wanted to reassure uh, taiwan and japan and reinforce the quads structure that quads was not a lost case quads was as important for america as aukus was and it was go- it was to apply a soothing balm to india and to japan uh, but interestingly keep in mind that with korea south korea the american relationship is on a different footing the south koreans are being wooed to set up a manufacturing plant in america to ensure that the american supply chain is not interrupted and america retains its technological lead in computers and computer chips and hardware etc uh, the us president was also trying to interest the asean countries into coming out more openly more explicitly in support of the american case against russia the various asian countries have criticized the violation of human rights or civil war like situations where civilians have been killed in ukraine but they have stopped short of uh, criticizing uh, russia harshly partly this is due because most asian countries have a very substantial economic relationship with china their trade depends on china they live under the shadow of china and they do not want to alienate china which is squarely in the side of uh, the russians at the moment very much so the americans have to tread carefully so president biden came out with another interesting thing he has projecting another indo pacific uh, economic cooperation framework now this is again very curious because this most countries in south not only in southeast asia including a japanese senior politician has said that americans should forget about this why should the americans project yet one more uh, common economic framework or an area of cooperation in indo pacific region when they themselves are following an extremely protectionist policy at home so which which only signals to the rest of the world that all the americans are doing is to create more and more multilateral frameworks which are not necessarily egalitarian but which only ensure the american economic interest and the american protectionism the malaysians the singaporeans have also been shown utter lack of interest in this now if you look at the other asean countries obviously myanmar obviously cambodia are out of this uh, agreement zone uh, the vietnamese have said that they will watch and study t- when specifics are made available to them uh the philippines has just had an election so it again is going to uh, tread with caution uh, brunei is a country which is very different more islamic uh, in content so then i think the american offer of a new multilateral framework for economic cooperation is not going to be cutting much ice countries like india have already opted out of rcep because they think that the chinese presence and the chinese domination would uh, result in dumping and hurt indian agricultural interests uh, india's nascent industries nothing much has changed there now as far as taiwan and japan are concerned they they are still worried that china has been indulging since the ukraine intervention by russia in provocative activities by violating the airspace of taiwan they're taking flights over japan and even north korea which is at the moment troubled by the outbreak of the disastrous outbreak of because it lacked vaccination it, it was very anti vaccinated stage it is a closed society refuses to accept assistance from anybody else 
is still indulging in provocative action and people were waiting and watching apprehensively that it might launch a yet another projectile or a missile to demonstrate that what mischief potential it has. But Japan and Taiwan both are worried that the Americans will they come to their aid when the chips are really down or will, are they only interested in protecting their own interest, their own bases so the Chinese or any other hostile power cannot hit them in the heartland very easily. But this is something, these bases are not indispensable for Americans now. Now the hypersonic missiles are there, now there are far more sophisticated, precise uh, nuclear weapons available, tactical weapons as they are called. So the American uh, doctrine has changed considerably since the Cold War when Japan and Philippines and other countries in Southeast Asia made a difference to them. Now the, th the Thais again are in ASEAN but they also are very wary of following a policy which alienates China. So it doesn't seem very likely that Biden is going to succeed very much with his ASEAN uh, odyssey. But still there is, it, it should not be uh, dismissed out of hand because it does show the dynamism of the American president who has often been accused of being very old, lacking initiative, that he still is trying to convey to the world that America has not withdrawn into a shell of isolationism. It has interest all over the world and it is the only country which can probably bolster the defenses against China of any other small country. But what we feel is still Biden will have to do a lot and American uh, administration will have a lot to reassure the rest of the world that the America is doing all this diplomatic activity to secure and ensure the interests of all the partners, not only to ensure it and protect its own economy and its own strategic interests. Among the most interesting actors in contemporary international relations is Turkey. Now, Turkey is situated at the tri-junction of Asia, Africa and Europe. It has played a great civilizational role over millennia. This is the site where the early Roman Empire was there. Then this is the place where the, uh, the Islamic civilization uh, blossomed. It was taken over in the 15th century by the by the Muslims and Constantinople, now Istanbul, became a center of Islamic culture and civilization. So this has been a melting pot, this has been a crucible uh, where uh, European civilization and the Asian civilization and the Islamic civilizations have confluenced. Uh, unfortunately, in recent part, the past, in European history, Turkey has been referred to as the sick man of Europe. It had elements of European civilization, it had an imprint of Islamic civilization, it was located in a place where it was in proximity of Russia, it was in proximity of Africa and this is what creates problems. This is what creates problems because it is strategically important for other major powers to control. Uh, control the Straits of Bosphorus and Dardanelles, it controls, it is the, supposed to be the gatekeeper uh, to the Black Sea. And the recent war of Russia with Ukraine has shown the strategic significance of what the Turkish can do. Now, but all this is past history. In more recent times, Turkey has been having an extremely uh, difficult, turbulent political time for two, three reasons. The major issue in Turkey has been how to cope with the Kurd minority. Now, the Kurds are a minority which are spread over Turkey, parts of Iran, parts of Iraq, parts of uh, uh, Syria. And the Kurds have always claimed to be an independent nation. And the Turks have obviously not uh, accepted this position. So the Kurd and the Turk struggle continues. There also has been a constant conflict ever since the days of Kamal Ataturk between the forces of modernity and secularism and those who have risen as a reaction to this enforced westernization, enforced uh, accelerated secularism uh, to Islamic orthodoxy and revivalism. Now, the present... Uh, leader Tayyip Erdogan is an extremely has an extremely interesting support base he is supported by the army which in various other countries is supposed to be a force for modernization uh, but in this case he also is supported by those 
who are advocates of Islamic orthodoxy. So there have been uh, Nobel Prize winning authors like Orhan Pamuk who have talked about uh, what this Islamic orthodoxy means in terms of curtailing uh, creative uh, freedom, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of religious belief, uh, the liberty to dress as you want, whether you have a scarf or a hijab or a veil or not. Uh, so you have a country which is living a life torn between contradictions. Now, Turkey at the moment also is pretty sophisticated in terms of technology. It makes uh, naval, uh, naval, naval vessels, um, fighter ships, cruisers, etc. It also has uh, reasonably developed where they have done reverse engineering. They have imported some drones, they have imported some uh, proje um, uh, projectiles, but re-engineered them in Turkey and they are exporting it. So Turkey is an interesting uh, supplier of military hardware to various countries in the world and it has built uh, naval ships uh, for Pakistan, it has helped some shipbuilding in Mazgaon docks in India and it is interesting. Now, Turkey is a member of NATO. It has been a member of NATO throughout the Cold War. But in recent years, Turkey under Erdogan has followed a line which has contradicted the policy prescriptions of NATO. Americans were building F-35 fighter aircraft in Turkey, but the whole project was cancelled because Turkey bought S-400 uh, anti-missile systems from Russia. Now, but the, but the NATO partners, the USA particularly, they, they scrapped the F-35 project but did not impose any sanctions. They just waited and watched uh, about Turkey. The same kind of favor uh, favored India because India had also ordered S-400 anti-missile batteries from Russia. So if they had not taken any action against Turkey, the US could not possibly hold sanctions uh, against India, impose sanctions against India also. So there is this consideration between Turkey. But the most recent controversy of Turkey in contemporary international relations is that Turkey has made it very clear that if Sweden and Finland apply for the membership of NATO, which they have applied, Turkey would block it. Now, all decisions of new members are taken, like in a club, by the consensus of all the members. Now, this creates a problem, because if Turkey says, I would, we would not allow Sweden and Finland to become members of NATO, then what happens to the guarantee which Americans are supposed to give under NATO to the members, ironclad clause 5 uh, uh, defense promise, that if a country, say for instance in this case, a dangerous neighbor like Russia uh, attacks them, all other members would consider it at, at an attack on themselves. Now, Turkey has since changed its attitude a little. It says, and the Americans also say, that probably Turkey can be persuaded to say, see reason. Now, what is the reason? Turkey says that our primary interest is that the Americans and the West and the, all the other European members of the EU should recognize that the Kurds are a terrorist group, uh, their organizations are terrorists, and they should not be treated as uh, a people who have a legitimate claim to self-determination. Whether EU and Americans will be willing to do this is something which remains to be seen. Or does, does like uh, Hungary, Turkey also would set a price on, in monetary terms to accede to these demands of Sweden and Finland. Uh, Hungary was being fined by EU almost one US do million dollars per day um, as it dragged its feet and it was not changing its laws in conformity with the European Union laws. Turkey at one time was a candidate member of the EU and it was kept waiting for a long time and then told that because it violated the EU norms of human rights and uh, European laws, it could not be admitted. Turkey remembers all these rights and the Turkish refugees in Europe have always been looked down on uh, and been treated differently because A, they profess Islamic faith and B, there's been an allegation that they are tied with uh, organized crime syndicates, etc. Now, if you keep all this in mind, Turkey has legitimate grievances against the European Union and against its NATO allies. It is facing a problem with Kurds. But then again, the interesting part is this, that the Turkey under Erdogan is facing two troubles. Its economy is in doldrums. There is inflation it has run amok. Uh, the central bank has failed to curb. There are charges of corruption and dynastic uh, interference of Erdogan's family in running of the government, but this has not curtailed the ambitions of Turkey to 
play a more prominent role in the Islamic world. The Turkey has managed a very interesting uneasy relationship with Russia where it has mediated in Armenia Azerbaijan conflict it comes to the aid of Russians when it comes to Dagestan Northern Caucasus Chechnya it also in Syria has had a odd relationship when the ISIS forces were being uh, defeated but after this has been done the situation changes in Syria but again uh, Assad has been trying to build bridges with his Arab neighbors and whether Turkey can play a role uh, to curb uh, uh, another aspirant for the leadership of the Islamic world like the Shia Iran remains to be seen. Uh, Turkey has other problems with other neighbors. It has laid claims to oil and gas resources under the seabed which has brought it into conflict with Greece. It has brought it into some kind of an uneasy alliance with Libya and Egypt. And these are complicated issues because the reservoirs of undersea bed gas are supposed to be the largest in the world. And if Turkey can control these, and Turkey has been indulging in a bit of a gunboat diplomacy to browbeat the Greeks. And the Greeks have a problem with Turkey because the island of uh, Cyprus was partitioned because of Greek Cyprus and the Turks influence. Um, so there is this situation where Turkey is both an destabilizing factor, a power which wants to be uh, asserting itself regionally, a power of the rise, but with a faltering economy and social divisions and fault lines, religious, ethnic within, within the country. So it would be worth watching what happens. Now, India has had an interesting relationship with the country uh, during the freedom struggle when India under Gandhi's advice supported the Khilafat movement against the forced modernization and secularization of Kamal Ataturk. At the moment contemporary India is also reinterpreting its own understanding of western secularism and forced modernity harking back to its ancient orthodox roots. So there are situations which are comparable, but which necessarily do not mean that there is always a coincidence of interest. Time to turn to the neighborhood. And interestingly, the world is watching with interest how Pakistan will cope with its economic crisis. Pakistan's situation, according to some economists, is as bad as Sri Lanka's. They have problems servicing their debts, their economy is in doldrums, the Chinese have bailed them out more than once, their Saudi Islamic brethren have come out with a dole, but they have also extracted their pound of flesh, the Pakistani leaders have had to suffer some insulting snubs, the Chinese also pressurize them to uh, do their bidding most of the time and the Pakistanis now blame everything on Imran Khan, they say that if Imran Khan who had negotiated successfully uh, $9 billion bailout from IMF. Had he followed the policies suggested by IMF, Pakistan would not be in this soup today. But Ibrahim Khan, to secure his populist base, did not bring out tax reforms, did not follow policies which could have restored Pakistani economy back to the rails and the IMF cut down its relief package, did not uh, came out with all the bails. At times, Saudi Arabs have asked Pakistanis to pay back whatever they had given for a short-term line of credit immediately. And Pakistani again seem to move from one relief package to another relief package. Interestingly, Pakistan has come out with a very interesting suggestion in recent past. When the Turkish leaders were uh, participating in a joint Pakistan-Turkey a shipbuilding program in Karachi, the, the newly appointed Pakistani Prime Minister said that Turkey is a time-trusted great brother and we would like to invite them to join as partners in China-Pakistan economic corridor. Now this is something which India has to watch very very carefully. If the Turks decide to join the China-Pakistan economic corridor, it would become a tripartite challenge for India where China and Pakistan combined was bad enough. But if Turkey joins them, it is almost a grouping which is inimical to India next door. Now, how will India respond to this? India in past has followed a policy of caution not to ruffle feathers in Turkey, partly because during the Khilafat movement, during the Indian freedom struggle, thanks to Mahatma Gandhi's advice, the Indians have supported 
the forces of uh, the caliphate against the enforced secularization, enforced accelerated modernization uh, uh, introduced by Kamal Ataturk. At the moment, India is itself having a close look at Western style of secularism, uh, modernism, westernization, and is harking back to its own ancient roots. This is what seems to be happening in Turkey, but this doesn't mean that there is a coincidence of interest. If, if there is a reassertion of the Islamic orthodox identity of Turkey, projection of its military power, especially naval power, transfer of technology in India's neighborhood in Karachi and Pakistan, and if Turkey joins in the China-Pakistan economic corridor, you have we said a little earlier that Turkey, the Turkey has a very interesting fraught relationship with Russia, despite Russia being a, a Christian country under Putin uh, with the remarkable imprint of the communist heritage, but they have managed this relationship very well. Now, China and Russia and Iran are already in one side. And if Turkey and Pakistan is there, this seems to be a rather adverse encirclement, embryonic at the moment, but for India. So India normally doesn't like to make a comment on anything which Pakistan does as a sovereign nation. But in this case, if Pakistan keeps including other partners, let's not forget that the China-Pakistan economic corridor is objected to by India and in a broader context, the One Belt, One Road project is objected to because it passes through, it infringes India's territorial sovereignty. Pakistan has handed over a bit of territory in forcibly occupied, park occupied Kashmir uh, to China and the corridor runs through this. So I think Turkey getting into this is complicating, internationalizing an already disputed area and Indians will have to watch this with caution. This is all we have for you this week. Some very interesting issues were discussed this time. One was uh, the continent of Africa and the volatile situation in Ethiopia, the second most populous nation in Africa, a country which has potential to become the breadbasket for the continent, but unfortunately the civil war is not allowing it to do so. A country which controls 80% of the flow of the Nile River, has ambitious plans to generate energy and provide irrigation. Uh, nourish agriculture in the whole uh, co this part of the continent again uh, not succeeding to do anything concrete partly because most of the money is spent on wasteful civil war and also the strife there seems to be destroying the diversity and the, the harmony social harmony of a country which has always lived without these conflicts but in recent past the civil war like situations is forcing tribal identities to clash with each other, destroy agriculture, destroy livestock, and the country has been suffering from internal displacement. Charges are exchanged about genocide, both sides, uh, whether it is a Tigray Liberation Front or whether it is the central government in Ethiopia, uh, humanitarian relief has not reached. So if this continues, turmoil will continue in Africa, and there is a very close relationship between what is happening in Ethiopia, a landlocked country, and its next door neighbor Somalia, which has been in the throes of Islamic terrorism, um, anarchy, uh, Chinese machinations next door in Djibouti, um, piracy, and the whole of this maritime sea routes being threatened by this instability. So all this we have to keep in mind about Africa, is likely to have a spillover effect elsewhere in Eastern African countries, in, particularly in Uganda and Kenya next door. Then we come to United States efforts to woo the Asian countries and larger uh, partners, uh, more important partners in the East Asian region who are members of quads to support the US bulwark against the Chinese expansion in Southeast Asia. The American president has come out with yet another multilateral framework for economic cooperation, but people are watching it with apprehension because they think that all such American efforts are to reinforce American protectionism, to maintain American supremacy, and others are not being treated, forget about equal partners, not being treated with due sensitivity about their national interest. Uh, the ASEAN's dependence on China for trade seems to be a major reason for their not taking a stance. 
then we also have an emerging power in like turkey which has ambitions of playing an important role politically its geopolitical situation is very sensitive but its economy is in doldrums so can a country whose economy is in a bad shape play a role significant role in international affairs is open to question but then the complication is if turkey is playing for broke it is trying to play a significant role in the immediate region to control the under the seabed gas resources and then restore its economy to good health again as far as india is concerned our concern should be neighborhood next door where pakistan is trying to woo turkey for its own reasons and inviting turkey to join in the china economic uh, pakistan economic corridor which passes through illegally occupied territory by pakistan which is indian territory so india will have to watch with caution what is happening turkey is to be watched ethiopia is to be watched and obviously the american president's uh, asian tour has to be given due significance because it allows the indian prime minister and the government of india to explore options for countervailing china in south china sea in indian ocean and to maybe examine what india can do bilaterally with other partners in aukus like uh, japan like korea like australia till we meet again next time thank you and goodbye